Chair Bowen, and uh, we have started the recording. Thanks everybody for joining and uh, welcome to our six RDI tutorials in 60 minutes. Today sponsored by Common Europe and brought to you by Help System Software. Great pleasure to be with you this morning. So let's leave SEU in the dusty past and continue the rational developer conversation this morning. My name is Chuck Lasinski and I'm the Director of Technical Solutions at Help Systems and I'm joined today by three of my software development heroes. Joining us today are Susan Gantner from Partner 400. Hello Susan, good morning. Good morning Chuck. And Charlie Garino from Central Park Data Systems. Hi Charlie. Good morning Chuck. And Steve Farrell also from Help Systems. Hi Steve. Good morning, Chuck. Good afternoon, right. Europe. Yes, yes, sir. And so a little bit about the logistics for today's uh, presentation. This webinar will last 60 minutes. We are monitoring questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to send those in to us. And we're open to any, any questions around RDI, certainly, or any questions you might have for any of us. Uh, we're more than happy to take those. If we don't get to your question right away, we'll answer it uh, following up with an email. We are recording today's presentation and we will be sending that out. Uh, uh, how long will it take to get that recording out, do you think, Chirban? It can be done tomorrow if we're happy. Excellent, excellent, okay. So uh, let's talk a little bit about why we're doing this webinar as well. So first of all, Susan and Charlie are very passionate about RPG and RDI education, and they're available to provide customized training for your company. Uh, Susan, any additional comments? Uh, no, I think you've covered it pretty well there, Chuck. Thanks. Okay, okay. Uh, so check out their websites, partner400.com, centralparkdata.com, and they can provide customized training for your needs. Also, Help Systems has taken over the development responsibilities for some popular IBMI software offerings, including Rational Developer for IB, uh, IBMI, BRMS, as well as PowerHA. This happened back in July of 2017. Uh, Help Systems is fully responsible for the software development for these tools. And specifically, Steve Farrell, who's joined us today, is responsible for managing those development efforts. So he's going to join us a little bit later in today's presentation to talk about where we're going in terms of roadmap and recent enhancements. And finally, at Help Systems, Though we're really best known for IT operations and automation as well as security tools, we also have a portfolio of developer, query, and database tools that can help you out for your software development. And no doubt that many of you are already Help Systems customers, and we very much appreciate that. All right, this brings us to our first polling question. We're hoping that you will participate in today's polling questions. We'll get some, aud some audience responses here. Question is, are you currently using Rational Developer RDI? All right, we'll give you maybe about 30 seconds to answer this question. And, and while you folks are answering this question, a uh, question for uh, both Susan and Charlie. Um, you're doing lots of training, obviously, all over the globe, and you've been doing that for a very long time. Uh, are you seeing the adoption rate of RDI changing? Have you seen a, a change maybe in the last few years, or does it go back further? I personally have seen um, a big change Probably, well, I mean, it's grown pretty steadily from the beginning, but I would say probably in the last three years, particularly RDI. I do both RDI and RPG training, and, and in that period, time period, we've kind of switched from doing mostly RPG and a little RDI to doing now mostly RDI with a little RPG. Gotcha. Charlie, how about you? I can certainly echo Susan's um, <clears throat> comments there, and I, I have definitely seen a, a significant uptick in the number of requests and the actual trainings that we're doing workshops all across the U.S. and 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 some in Europe as well. Gotcha. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's share the results of our poll. Hang on one second. Okay. 
So uh, the results of our polling looks like this. Looks like we've got some experienced users out there. We have nobody who has not touched the product whatsoever. So that's good to see. And um, so a, a combination, I'd say, of uh, participants here. And certainly we're gonna show some, uh, some new stuff today. And let's talk about our agenda. One moment. There we go. Okay, our agenda today. First, we're going to jump into about 40 minutes worth of RDI tutorials with Charlie and Susan. And then Steve's gonna jump in with latest enhancements as well as roadmap, and then we're gonna get to your questions. All right, and with that, let's turn things over to Charlie. So Charlie, I am gonna make you the person in charge of this webinar. Hang on one second. Great. There you are. Uh, no, I don't see it yet. Oh, there we go. There we okay. Go. Hold on, please. Let me just share my screen. Give me one moment. Okay, great. Hopefully you're looking at my, my little screen with my three tutorials listed there. Looks good, Charlie. Great. So hello, everybody. It's really a treat for me to, uh, to be one of the presenters here, joining my fellow IBM champion, Susan Gantner, and also Steve Farrell with um, Help Systems. So I, we are doing six tutorials. I'm, I'll be doing the first three, and you can see what they are here. Overview of RDI, LPEX Basics, and Advanced Editor Tools. So with that, let me start with the first one, which is a discussion of Eclipse perspectives and some of the views that RDI has. So let me open up RDI, give me one second. Here is my RDI screen. So tutorial one is really just a, 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 re, uh, a, re, a review of, of Eclipse in general and RDI. And I'm going to use the term RDI and Eclipse as the same term, but it's important to know that RDI sits on top of Eclipse. Eclipse is a, an open source product. You can go to eclipse.org and download this product, this tool that looks very much like RDI. What it doesn't have, however, is IBM I awareness, and that's why you get RDI from IBM and now Help Systems, because Eclipse out of the box doesn't have IBM I awareness. This current desktop, which is called a perspective, and RDI has multiple personalities or different desktops, and those are perspectives. And you can see over here, as I hover to the right side, at the top right, that cur I'm currently right now in my Remote System Explorer, also known as RSE. But as I said, RDI does have multiple personalities. So for example, as Susan will be talking about later, you can do debugging. And I just clicked on debug and she'll be going over this more. But there are also plugins that are not necessarily made by IBM or help systems that you can get. One perfect example of that is Git. And you can download for free a Git perspective and, and start doing Git within or within Eclipse or RDI. Another perspective that I don't have listed here is iSphere. And that's a, an, another plugin, iSphere. And you can download that for free and it extends the functionality of RDI. So let's go into back into the Remote System Explorer and show you some basic reviews of what, what we can do here. So as I'm hovering over these little windows here, these are called views. And as I click on any individual one, and you, just like click just on that, you can see that it gives it gives that window focus or that view focus. Now the nice thing about RDI, and I say this to everybody and anywhere I go, if you don't have multiple monitors attached to your system, you are not getting full advantage of your system of of RDI because RDI gives you the, the wonderful ability to completely move this screen around, navigate it, make these windows or these views bigger or small as you see fit, just like that. And you can also drag them to a second monitor. Now, the reason why that's so important is because that will extend your uh, productivity very quickly. A common question I get when I'm talking about perspectives and moving things around is, what's the perfect configuration for the screen? And my answer is, I don't know, it depends, because what's making me most productive at 9 a.m. may not make me most productive at 
2 p.m. in the afternoon. So a nice feature is that once you have a comfortable outline of how, how you feel you're most productive, I can click on window just like this, go to perspective and say save perspective as, and this will give me the chance to now give this configuration a different name. Later on, if I want to come back to this configuration, I can click on window and say perspective again, open perspective, and the name that I just used will have now appear in this drop down list. I highly encourage you to do that because this is a quick way for you to have to completely tailor this to have to your productivity. Now watch this. You can never ruin this because at any given time I can click on perspective and say reset perspective back to my defaults and I'm right back to where I started. So I highly encourage you to do that. Another feature of this screen, which I really like, is this, is this feature here called quick access where I can type in anything RDI or I, uh, IBM I related. For example, I just typed in the word RPG and it will filter out all of the information that RDI knows about RPG and all different things I can do with an RPG. And it's a very quick way to get to those. Another example right there would be LPEX. LPEX is the name of the editor, Live Parser Extensible Editor. LPEX is what replaces SEU. So if you're using SEU uh, today in green screen, you'll be using LPEX. And just one more thing on views, I think it's kind of cool, is one of the newer views, I'm going to, on perspectives rather, I'm going to switch on this thing over here called PDM. Now PDM came out about a year and a half ago. This is really good because this, if you're not using PDM perspective or if you're new to RDI, this is a quick on-ramp to get used to R, uh, RDI very quickly because it looks just like PDM. Watch this, drop that down. What does that resemble? That looks like one, two, three in PDM. So I have member here, I can type in a library name right there, a source physical file, and I can type in uh, just an asterisk and hit apply, and that will of course give me every member in my library. I can certainly just type in the word FIX, just like that, as I can do in PDM, and there they are right there. I have an option column just like that. I can just type another keyword, UPD, that will give me my, my updates. But what I really like is this. So if I just do this, go back here and type in, let's say anything that has the word update in the text. Now it doesn't matter what the member name begins with. That's kind of cool. Especially what I like about this is one last thing before I get to the next tutorial, because we have a lot to show you, is I can watch what I can do here. I can now create a filter. I can say, let's say demo filter, whoop, demo filter, come down here and I can say save. And I just did that. When I go back to my RSE, Look what it did. It just added demo filter right to my list just like that. So it's a quick way to navigate within the tool. Really very cool stuff. All right. And with that, I'm actually already going to switch to my second tutorial because we're going very quick here. And I want to show you some basics of LPEX, things you can do in LPEX. So let me bring up RDI again. And I'm going to close this filter just like that and open up this one. And now I'm going to open up a couple of different members here. So I'll open up this one. I'll double click on that. That will open it up for edit. Here it is. It's opening it up just like that. I'll open up one more. Yeah, I'll open up this one just because. And one more I'll open. I'll open up this one. But this one I'm going to open up. I'm going to right click on that and say browse. So what I'm doing here is I have two open for edit, which already is a complete, is double click to expand that. This is a complete change from what you can do in SCU. SCU, you can only type in, you can only edit one member at a time. Whereas now I'm, I have two open for edit. I can tell I have the pencil there. And this one is in browse mode. Now imagine this, now this says browse, as you can see right here. Let's say I open this up with the wrong mode. I opened it in browse and I want to go to edit or vice versa. Now, if I was in SCU and I opt opened it with option five or two, I would have to get out of the member and then go back and open it up again. Not the case because there's a nice new feature here. Here's the member right here. Click on source and I can now come down to where it says toggle edit or browse mode, or I could just press control shift and G. That's a shortcut. Do that and watch what happens. 
the browse goes away and now the pencil appears. So now what I've just done is I've taken this particular member out of browse mode and I'm now in edit mode for this browser. That's very, very good. And of course, if I want, I can uh, do a split screen. I can drag this down if I really want it. I could, whoops, I can, I could have multiple, open up multiple members at one time. So forget F15 and SEU. If you're used to F15 where you want to open another member and do a CC and CC and A, if you know what I'm talking about, and then do an A over here, just copy and paste your code. It's much more easy to do that. I'm going to X a couple of these out just like that. And I, cause I want to focus on this one right here now. You may notice that when I first opened this up, or when I open it up now, I have this, I have these little tick marks every now and then. I'm not quite sure what they are. Well, actually I do know what they are. If I hover over them just like that, you'll see that RDI is actually putting a message there. LPEX is giving me a message and the message is saying, hey, that particular data structure, and it's called Zcont, and you can see what it is, is not used in this program. So what happens is when you first open up a member, the, um, initially LPEX goes through a very quick parsing process and it will help identify members that are uh, not members, definitions rather that are not referenced. Now, why is that important? If you think about the application modernization and code modernization roadmap, there are many facets to it, but one of the steps is to remove dead code. And that's a very significant thing because I've seen some programs, I'm sure you have, that have tens of thousands of lines of code and maybe only half the code itself or even more is not being used. So watch what I can do here. These are, in this case, I have all these data structures here that are not being referenced. Well, obviously over I wouldn't just want to delete them, but over time I can examine my code and see if they're relevant. But now I have this other view called the outline view right here. And my outline view is kind of cool because this also will respect the unreferenced definitions. So here are all my same data structures. And you notice these are the same ones that have the little tick mark over here. And I love the outline view. It helps me quickly navigate in my code. But if I wanna really get a full concentrated view of the source code, this new feature here, hide unreferenced definitions. If I click on that, watch what happens. What, what LPEX just did, what the outline view just did, was now it just is now just showing me that in this case, the three particular data structures that are truly being used. So these are not being used. And unreferenced definition is not just data structure. If I have files, anything else that's defined but not used, it will, um, it will have that blue tick mark, which is very, very cool. So let me close the outline view and show you a couple more things real quick that I think are worth pointing out. Uh, what can I show you here? Let's see, let's say I have this block of code right here for some reason, this is, you know what, I don't need this code right here. I'll just highlight it. I'll right click on this and then click on source. Then I'll say, you know what, just do a quick comment on that because I don't need that code. Isn't that cool? So it's a very quick way. Imagine if you were an SAU, if you had to do that, that would take you forever to do that. The other thing I want to show you quickly before we go to the next tutorial is this. How many times have you been in a very large program? And you notice here that I have, let me go back to my code here, give me a moment. I may have a lot of standalone fields defined as I do right here. Now I might be at the bottom of my program, for example, the very bottom of the source code, and I'm introducing new variables into my program. Well, if I'm doing that, I have to go back and go back into the D specs and define them. Well, what a pain that becomes having to go up and down in my program. So I'm going to now press control and number two. And what that just did is that now split my screen. So what that lets me do is I now have two complete open views of the same exact program. I can now come to the top over here, leave it in my despec section and come to the bottom over here. And as I'm typing in new fields, for example, as I'm doing that new variables. So whatever I'm doing over here, x equals y, let's say y was a new field or a new variable rather, I can just come right here and declare it up here without, and so again, quickly navigating. All right, let me now close these because I want to go into the next tutorial. I'm not, I'm going to not save this. I want to start fresh. And let me go back to my little screen over here and show you what I have next. The third tutorial is uh, refactoring and content assist. These are really some pretty, some pretty cool advanced techniques and I wanna watch 
what this does. So let me open up this member again. So we'll click on it, to open it up for edit. Here it is. I'll now make it large. All right, so if you have older code, or if you even have brand new code, but you're using old tables, for example, or you, you have you have some old references to old variables, you know, if, uh, we're, if you're using old code, historically you were constrained to small field names, six characters, 10 characters, but I've seen many, many programs that only have one character field, X, for example, and that doesn't do anybody any good. So I'm just gonna scroll down a little bit I want to show you something that's really cool. It's refactoring tool that came out, refactoring function. So look what I have over here. I have, I have, I have this variable X over here, which doesn't really mean anything. In this case, it's a really, it's, I'm defining it as a some type of process, but we just called it X, and that's not good. So think about this. If I wanted to just come along here and do a global find and replace. If I press control F and look for the letter X and say anywhere I see letter X, I wanna change it with the word process. If I click on all, notice that I have all these different lines, 244 different lines where it found the letter X. So if I were to rename that letter X with a global find and replace, it would, it would make my code virtually unreadable. However, let me go back to my line over there, which I was just showing you. This nice tool called refactoring understands RPG. It's as if a programmer is in the code. Watch what happens here. I'm going to double click on that letter X. Now I'm going to right click on that. Now refactoring is a term that I like because it really means making the code more readable without changing the functionality of the code. So I right clicked, I, I double clicked on letter X. I'm going to say rename that that letter X, and what it's showing me here is saying, okay, you want to rename variable X? Yes, I do. I want to rename it with the word process. And then I'll say preview. And RDI, or LPEX, is going to in very intelligently examine my source code and only change the references to letter X where it makes most sense. It's not going to change all 244 lines, only in this case, 27 references. But now I'll say continue. And this is a nice preview window. It's showing me the before and after of all the places where it makes sense to change. There's even a nice thing, a drop down window here, and it's showing me individual lines, and I can uncheck certain lines if I want. You don't do that one, don't do that one, for example. Now, when I say OK, it literally, very quickly, as you just saw, changed every instance of the word, the letter X rather, to the word process, where it, and only where it made sense. This is, this is, a, such a powerful tool, refactoring. And again, this is, and here's, here are the two that I unchecked that they remained. And again, thinking back to the roadmap to modernization is you want to make your, clo uh, your code more readable and more maintainable. This is very, very important. I say this everywhere I go. Source code is, is a company's, one of the company's most strategic assets. And it's very important to make your code completely flexible and scalable. All right, the final thing I wanna show you before I turn it over is another feature called Content Assist. So all I'm going to do here is just come to any random spot in my code, and I'm just going to type in RP15 to give myself some blank space over here, just like that. All right, so let's talk about Content Assist. Content Assist is where LPEX helps provide you with other features in the code or other, other it has knowledge about other functions. For example, if I wanna do built-in functions, if I say, if I say X equals percent, look what just happened. By doing that percent, LPEX understands RPG and it understands that whenever, when I have this configuration, some letter equals a percent sign, then I'm doing a built-in function. So it brought up this very nice window automatically and these are all of the built-in functions that RPG supports. And it's really great because what I can do now is I can, I can click on, as I click on any one of these, you'll see this little help window here, the text window is telling me about that function. But also if I come back over here, and if I, if I say percent sub, just like that, I now will now just get a much more condensed window of the functions that begin with SUB, as you can see right there. So let's say I wanted anyone, I'll just double click on this one. So I've just double clicked on that. What LPEX has done for me is it now brought 
that function back into my code. And not only that, but right above it, as you can see, it's telling me, in this case, I have two parameters. It's actually telling me what to put in that parameter. So it, as you can see where I am, it has the word array uh, bold, bold. So it's telling me that it, went, it put the name of the array in there. And if I go to the next one, notice that now it says, what is the start index? That's what belongs in there. So I can type in start index, for example. So it's helping me construct my code. This is such a powerful function. I should point out that not only does it work with built-in functions, but it also understands your own procedures. So if you have a procedure name and type it in, it will then bring up the same window and give you the parameters to your procedure. The last little thing I want to show you here, but hardly a little thing, is uh, also a continuation of content assist, and that's templates. There are built-in templates or snippets of code that LPEX provides. So one that I like to show all the time is SQL code. If you're doing any SQL programming at all, you're familiar with SQL code, that's the value. SQL code is the value that gets automatically updated by the system and you can test the, the value of SQL code to see the results of an SQL operation. So here is a template of, a template of code or a snippet of code. If I just double click on this, Yes, I want that. What it just did was it brought into my code a, a perfect snippet of code that will automatically um, test the value of SQL code. And now it's even telling you. So in this case, it generated a select statement when SQL code of less than zero, it's telling you what to put in that block of right there. This is when execution is was not successful, equal to 100, things like that, greater than zero. So it's a nice way to put your own um, snippets of code in there, you can build your own templates, and there are many, many, many features and templates that are built into the editor. I really encourage you to look at templates. You'll really see a, a significant boost in your RPG productivity and your coding of your RPG. All right, I think I am at the end of my time. So what I'd like to do is turn the presentation for the tutorials four through six to Susan Gantner. Susan, it's all yours. And Susan, I've given you control. There you go. Thank you. Charlie, thanks very much for those uh, tutorials. It's a lot of stuff to cover in a very short period of time. So I'm going to carry on with these tutorials and I'm going to do the three that you're seeing here. Oops, sorry about that. Didn't mean to do that. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna be talking about code navigation and information and then a little bit later, we'll go into compiling code and debugging code, things that all RPGers do all the time. Susan, can you hear us? We cannot hear you. Did we drop her? For example, I can just hover over ah. a variable name and what I see is um, the definition of it as well as the context that is in this case, the fact that it is uh, inside a data structure. Um, and I can also see if there are comments specifically associated with that particular item, um, I can see that as well. So uh, there's a lot of information, a wealth of information that I can see just by hovering on things like that. Um, and I can also see that, for example, here I have a constant and I can see what its value is. Um, it's not just those things. I can also look at uh, routines like subroutines, for example, and it shows me the subroutine and the comments that may be associated with that subroutine. And by associated, by the way, what I mean is that the comment that comes immediately before it or on the same line with it at the end of the, of the line where the definition occurs. And a subprocedure, of course, the same thing happens. Not only do I see the name of it, but also the parameters and any return values that it provides along with the comments. So there's a lot of things I used to use. Uh, I used to have to go to outline view for. I don't even have to do outline anymore. I can now do that directly in the editor. 
Another thing that RDI helps me with a lot is when I'm working with older style code. Code I'm looking at here is fairly modern, uh, freeform, but unfortunately I'm sometimes working with code that looks more like this. And uh, in this case, I've got a pretty horrible looking bit of, uh, of nested logic here. Um, I have um, a whole bunch of ifs and elses, and uh, I love this part at the end. I have end, 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 else, go to, and another end. Um, not even an end if or end do in there anywhere. So, uh, you know, it's this kind of code that can be very difficult to work your way through. So uh, what I use a lot in this case is I will go into the source and I will uh, say that I want to show block nesting. Now, by the way, I'm on a Mac as opposed to Windows. So if you're on a Windows machine, your shortcuts will look a little bit different from mine. So show block nesting is actually control shift O um, in uh, Windows. And so you can see what that does is it kind of draws these little lines here. Let me go full screen so you can see, see it properly. And uh, so it draws these little lines to help make that a lot easier. I don't have to be at the top. I can be at the end of a block. I can even do it from the else, for example, to sort of branch out in both directions to see uh, where things are. Now with free format code, of course, I could do the same thing. I could do uh, draw those little lines here. But of course, usually free format code is typically already indented for me, like you see here. But suppose I have some bit of code that isn't indented properly, or perhaps I don't trust the indentation perhaps that's in there to be able to trust that it, it reflects the actual logic. So I've got a subroutine here that I've uh, done like that without any indentation at all. So in this case, I can just select that whole block of code. So what I've done, what I'm doing is I'm, I've done Alt L. You notice I use a lot of keyboard shortcuts. And by the way, a little bit later, I'll be telling you where you can get my favorite uh, keyboard shortcut list. Um, so uh, I have selected the items here, and what I can now do is I'm going to again do it through the, the slow way rather than the, the uh, shortcut way, so you can see what's happening. Um, and I can go through. Oops, sorry about that. I can go through here, and I can say that I want to format that, or I could just use uh, the Control Shift F uh, shortcut if I were going to do that. And that formats the code very nicely for me. So I not only can uh, see what the logic is, but I can actually see it and save that now as a part of my freeform code. And of course, if you ever don't like the formatting for some reason, want to turn it back, you can always just undo it with uh, Control Z. Um, so the, uh, the next thing, the last thing that I want to show you in this particular tutorial is one of my favorite features in terms of navigating through uh, large programs. Let me find the bit of logic that I'm looking for here. Sorry about that. Um, so here, let's say I've got this uh, select when here. I've got a select when block. And what I want to do is I want to, uh, I get to here and I get to this logic and I say, oh, I'd really like to go look at that subroutine logic. I need to go look at it to see what's going on here. So the next thing I want to do is go to that subroutine. Lots of ways I can get there. I'm sure you all have your favorite ways of moving from, uh, you know, finding a subroutine or a subprocedure inside a source member. My favorite way is to use the function key three. So I've just done F3 and that took me directly to the subroutine. Notice at the bottom, there's a little message here that says, uh, if I press Alt and left arrow, it'll switch back to my original location. So what I typically want to do is I want to read through the subroutine and I go through the logic. And when I get to the end of the subroutine, what I then want to do is I want to go back where I came from. So I just press that Alt left arrow as the message said, and it took me directly back to where I was before. So to me, that's really important. The fact that I can not only get there, but I can get back where I was. That saves me a ton of time because I'm forever forgetting where I was and having to go back. It works the same with um, procedures. So I could uh, F3 on this procedure. And it also works on definitions. So for example, if I just do an F3 on a variable uh, definition that's defined internally, it takes me directly to that in case I wanted to make that field bigger or something like that. So that is um, a very quick uh, demo of the some of my favorite things in terms of program understanding and um, information and navigation through the code.
So a quick reminder here of the things we covered about hover and nested logic and navigations. And I promised that because I use a lot of shortcuts in that uh, demonstration, that I would let you know that you can download my version of my favorite uh, shortcut cheat sheet uh, from the systemidevelopercom uh, downloads page. So let me go ahead then and quickly move on to uh, the next one of my tutorials, which is for compiling code. I find that a lot of people I talk to say they love the editor in RDI, but they always go in and edit the code in RDI and then go back to PDM to do their compiles. I talk to them and there are sometimes various reasons for that, so I thought maybe I would try to address some of those here uh, just for a moment to see if there might be, if some of you might have some of the same issues and maybe it will help. First of all, I want to show you why I think it's so important to compile from, um, from RDI instead of going back to PDM. So uh, let me just do a compile. So I've got my code here. I'm just going to the compile menu. Again, I would typically do this from a shortcut, but I'm going to show you that I can do this from the um, CrateBound RPG from the compile menu. And it, uh, of course, if I'd made any changes, it would ask me to save them. But the important thing here is that, of course, what happened is that I did have some errors. And my error list pops in at the bottom. Now I can double click on the error and it positions me to that line of code. So now all I need to do is correct that particular item and then I move on to the next one. Notice it puts the little check marks next to any errors that were associated with that line. I move on to the next one and now I find that, oh, I've just misspelled that uh, field name. So I can uh, change that one as well. It looks like everything's okay here. So I can now go back to my compile menu. Or as you can see, I have trouble with this because I usually use the shortcuts. I was, I just apologize, I don't usually uh, go through these menus so often. Um, I would normally have done a control shift C at this point to repeat the same uh, compile that I'd done before. Yes, save my changes. And it will go back and do the compile. And hopefully I'll now see that I have no errors in my, in my code. Now some of you maybe don't see this um, all messages uh, completely empty error list because perhaps you haven't filtered out as I have the uh, informational messages, all those zero, zero messages like this. Um, yes, they come at the end of the list, so I, you, know, it's, you can know that you have a clean compile, but I think it's much more effective and easier to tell that I have a clean compile if I just get rid of all of those uh, zero, zero messages. So I like to do that to make things a little bit easier for me. The other thing that I uh, sometimes uh, people tell me they have trouble with is setting their library list for compiles. So I just like to remind people that your library list over here in remote systems is the library list in most cases, unless you've got something set up a bit a little bit unusual in your shop. Uh, this is the library list for RDI, and it's the uh, library list that will typically be used for your compiles and things. And so. Of course, you can go to the library list filter, you can add entries, you can change your current library, you can click on a library that's already in the library list and move it up and down in the list or remove it from the library list. So, uh, you know, there are lots of ways in which you can manipulate your library list to make it work properly. And if you don't see the library list here by default that you want, of course, the proper thing to do would be to go to properties of your objects and go to initial library list. And there you can set up, you have a lot of controls over how your library list, your default library list is set up for, you, for your compiles and for your RDI and populating your outline view and everything else. So you have the current library, you can add additional libraries and you can even call a command like a CL program that will uh, take care of setting that stuff up for you. And that way, every time you come in, your library list will be set up properly that way. Uh, one additional thing that I like to set up that's a little different uh, here is I like to go into my preferences and I don't like to do my compiles in, as a separate batch job. So if I search in preferences for command, whoops, if I could spell command, uh, and I go to command execution under IBMI and remote systems, what I have is an option uh, for compile and batch, which by default is set up um, to, to compile and batch. I turn that off 
for my use. I think it's a more streamlined approach if I don't have to worry about a separate job or getting stuck in a queue somewhere. And also if I have any errors uh, that occur that like binding type errors that are not compile errors. So I need to go look at the job log. It's easier for me to find what that job is. And of course the way I, I do that is to go into jobs up here and I go into my host server jobs and my um, RSC job, RSC server job is right here. So I can display the job log or whatever I need to do to find out what might have gone wrong in there if necessary. So that's uh, another little thing that I prefer to do that's a little bit different from the default setup. And while we're talking about a little different from the default setup, one other thing that I also recommend to people is if you go in, sorry, let me give focus to my editor here for a moment and go into compiles and work with compile commands. I never work with the default compile commands in RDI as they come. Um, let me just zoom in a little bit so perhaps you can see that a little better. So um, I, for example, my regular create bound RPG and create RPG module always say output star none. That won't produce a spool file because I don't need a spool file to see my errors anymore. My errors return directly into RDI. So why would I bother having to produce that spool file? And I prefer debug view all instead of debug view source which is what uh, RDI normally defaults to. So I changed that one. In addition to that, so I have all my, my regular compile, compile commands set to do those kinds of things. In addition to that, I have some special ones, like I have a previous release compile. So this one is set to go target release 7.1. And I have an override compile, which actually calls a completely separate program. Uh, to do the compile. It calls the CL program, which does some overrides first before it does the compile. So you do have all of those options available to you uh, for doing compiles that are perhaps a little bit different from the standard compiles that you might normally need to do. So I hope maybe that uh, if any of you are in the category of people that I often talk to about uh, people who don't do their compiles in RDI, I hope Maybe I've been able to solve some of those issues for you. Um, if not, let's see if we can solve an issue for you, perhaps with uh, debugging. Uh, debugging, of course, is a topic that uh, usually takes um, a lot longer than the few minutes that I have here. But I thought I'd take the time to show you just a couple of uh, tips that help people sometimes in terms of debugging their code. So I'm going to go back over into RDI here. And I'll show you the way that I like to start my debug sessions. So I'm over here in remote systems and I'm going to find the program object that I want to debug. I can do debug from the source code, uh, but personally, it's just a little bit of a, a preference for myself. I like to use the actual program object because I feel more confident I've got exactly the right thing. Um, now notice, by the way, I, it could be a service program and I'll show you the uh, implication of that in a moment. So I'm going to right click on the uh, program that I want to debug and I like to use service entry points. So I'm going to say debug service entry, set service entry point. And what's happening with the service entry point is that the system is going to set up a little monitor and look for the occasion where that particular program gets called specifically by my user profile. So what we see here is I have my user ID showing up. Sorry, I should uh, point it out down here. I'm in the IBMI service entry point view at the bottom. And I have my uh, user ID and the program name, specific program in a specific library. Now notice I've, it defaults to all modules and all procedures. I mentioned earlier that it might be a service program you want to debug and in that case perhaps it's only one or two modules or procedures that you want to specify. So you can always right click here and you can um, modify this. You can also change the user ID for example if you have to run the program under a different ID to make that work. So right now the system is waiting for this program to start. So let me go over and start that program uh, over here in the green screen. It could be a, um, a green screen, it could be a batch job, it could be a web server job, it doesn't really matter. But I'm gonna call specifically. 
I, I have a hard time talking and keying at the same time, so um, a little pause there. So let me call it, and now it's pausing for a moment while it automatically switches me over. Uh, I didn't do anything to change that perspective. Charlie showed you how to change perspectives earlier. I didn't have to do anything to change the perspective. RDI automatically put me into the debug perspective, as you see up in the top right over here. And it also automatically opened up the source member for that particular bit of code that I want to run. So I can do a lot of things within debug. I could probably spend a half hour just on showing you the things that I can do here. But um, very quickly, I'm sure many of you know some of the basics, like you can set a breakpoint. So a matter of fact, I've actually already got a breakpoint in this program. Um, so you can see this breakpoint right here is uh, one that has come up. I can also see it in my breakpoints over here. But notice that it's got a little check mark next to it or check box that was not checked. So I checked it, so it was disabled. So I had a disabled breakpoint in there. I can enable it now, and so now I have an active breakpoint there. I just sort of inadvertently uh, demonstrated something uh, there, the fact that the breakpoints and as well as your monitors, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, are remembered from one debug session to another, so you don't have to keep redoing them every time you go into a debug session. So that's kind of a handy thing as well. So I've set a breakpoint. That's pretty standard stuff in uh, uh, debug capabilities. Um, I also can hover over. So remember I hovered over uh, variables before and what I was seeing was the definition. Because I'm in debug mode here, when I hover over it, what I see is the value of it. So this hover over this array and it shows me all the array elements and what their current values are. I also have a variables view up here at the top, which shows the uh, values of all of the variables in the program, which sounds like a really handy thing. And it is really handy, except that if you have a very large program, which we have a lot of sometimes within RPG, uh, you, it can take a long time to populate this view. So I find that it's actually better in my example, to, or in my experience rather, to uh, use the monitors view here. So in this case, I already have one monitor, just like I had the breakpoint left over. I have a monitor left over here for the message variable. And if I want to put a different variable uh, in there, for example, let's, uh, let's just take uh, the, the max variable here. I can right click on it and say monitor expression, and it pops it up over here. Also from the monitors view, as well as from the variables view, I can change the value. So I can put this one to new value, if I could spell it. Uh, and so now uh, I have the new value for that variable. And if I go back and hover over message somewhere, there it is, um, I should now see that it has that, that new value in it. So that's how we do a, the equivalent of change program variable. Um, the other thing, of course, that I can do, like with the green screen debugger, any other debugger that you've used, is I can step. So if you see up at the top, I have various types of stepping that I can do. I can do the step into, which is the same as F10 in the green screen. I can do step over, which is the same as shift F10 uh, in the green screen. Um, and you can see that that's done with F5 and F6 here. Uh, and I also have a special one that I'll show you in just a moment. So let me just go ahead and do a quick uh, step here. I'm not going to step into this one because that would go into that uh, definition. Let me just do a run actually, and it will stop right there where the breakpoint is. And uh, then what I can do is I can step into the call to the to that sub procedure. That's an external sub procedure, so it brought the source up for that. Now suppose that I'm stepping through this procedure and I decide, you know, I don't really think the problem is here. I want to go back to the caller and stop on the next line of code. I can use F7 or the step return option. So um, that takes me back to where I was uh, in that uh, debug, in the original debug program. Um, and from there, of course, I could just run to the end. Uh, I'm just going to disable that breakpoint here temporarily um, so that I can just run to the end of the program. And it's terminated. Of course, now if I needed to debug the same program again, all I have to do is call it because I still have the remote, the um, sorry, service entry point 
uh, still set up here. So every time I call that program, it will just restart the debug session. So sorry about that, went to the wrong place. And so I'd have the, we talked about debugging, starting the session with a service entry point, setting and disabling breakpoints, monitoring and changing variable values, and we did several different flavors of step. So that is my quick view of some tips for debugging in RDI. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Chuck. Susan, that was fantastic. Thank you, Charlie, as well. And let's bring in Steve Farrell to talk about enhancements and roadmaps. So Steve, I'm going to give you control of my desktop. Go for it. Okay. So what I'm going to talk about, uh, kind of what is coming. Um, you've seen a few things that we've added in uh, version 9.6. Um, one of the things we want to focus on here at uh, Help Systems is to continue to build on success. And to do that, we uh, want to focus in different areas, which include security, reliability, productivity, and currency. And we're going to explain a little bit of what that means. Um, from security, it's really a matter of making sure that Java is up to date. Um, we'll do that quarterly. Uh, we use the IBM process called uh, p to make sure that we're up to date. Um, for reliability, in this next release coming out, we've uh, fixed 16 APARs. Um, Chuck talked about the fact that we're the development team for uh, RDI. We're also the level three support. Um, so that means in, when you run into issues, um, you'll go ahead and contact IBM using the PMR system, and then we'll go ahead and get those uh, bug fixes out um, as soon as we can. One of the other things we've done with uh, this upcoming version 9606, um, which uh, I think IBM pre-announced uh, the dates uh, will be in May, um, we've uh, added some performance enhancements. Uh, one of the things you'll, you'll notice that Ch uh, Charlie had talked about was the uh, uh, quick view and the PDM perspective. Uh, really, it was a matter of those quick filters. And when you start playing with those quick filters, you'll see that it's actually faster than using the RSE perspective. So by actually going in and doing it, the, the filters themselves are faster. And that's the kind of what we want to continue to, to do. Um, some other enhancements, uh, the annotations, those little blue marks that uh, Charlie was showing. Um, we, we've made some improvements in that arena as well, trying to make sure that uh, we show you truly when they're not used. Um, because one of the things you want to do is if you want to comment them out, you want to make sure they aren't used. And if you have a data structure that uh, does use some of them, you wouldn't want to comment out that entire data structure. So um, productivity. Uh, again, we added the uh, PDM perspective in 9602, and that came out of a, a, a training session that uh, Susan had done where I noticed that there were a lot of people that still hadn't used RDI. They'd been doing RPG for um, over 20 years and hadn't had taken time to, to uh, play with it. So one of the things that we're trying to do is get that kind of a bridge for people to say, okay, I've used PDM, I have memory muscle, I wanna make sure to, to uh, use that memory muscle. And because of that, you know, anything you can do with the mouse we're going to try to make it happen with the keyboard as well. So in 9606, we've added the, the Shift F1 um, combination, which in uh, RDI is going to be Alt F1. So from the options field, you'll be able to put in an option, say copy um, option three, do Alt F1, and it will repeat that option through. Um, we also added, so you can go in and type in multiple options and they'll get group run together. In the past, you know, the, the object table has been there in RDI all along. We've just made some improvements to the quick filters and added the option field. Um, in the past, we would always pop up a separate command each time. Well, that got to be cumbersome if you were to, to try to copy 15 members, that you're gonna get 15 commands. So one of the things we've done with this is, and again, one of our focus is going to be on consolidated views. So when you're gonna be doing multiple actions, we wanna give you a nice copy to dialogue. I'll show you um, what that looks like here in a minute. 
Um, Susan also talked about compiling, and one of the one of the difficult uh, times in the past was we always used the same job name. Um, so now what we're doing is is one of the enhancements we've uh, implemented with 9606 is to use the member name whenever we can. Um, so you'll actually be able to look in the jobs and find them by your member name, similar to uh, you would see in PDM. Um, another function for productivity, it's really, it's a matter of, you know, the, the neat thing about RDI and Eclipse is like Charlie showed you, you can, you can decouple views. Um, one of the enhancements we put in this one is to be able to zoom in and, and zoom out on the editors. So you'll be able to use the uh, control uh, plus and the control minus um, and increase and decrease the font size. Makes it a little easier to see. Um, one of the other advantages of RDI over PDM or SEU is you can actually take and turn your screen if you want. So you, you can get a much larger viewing area. Um, and of course, if you're doing that, that's where the zoom in and zoom out will really um, come in handy. Um, now, Charlie also showed the rename, and the rename was one of the first um, items added in 96000 um, for refactoring. And one we added in 9606 is extract string constants. I'll show you a screen for that in a second here also. Um, but that's really a way to, you know, again, to minimize the number of strings you have um, you want to get them into one location so you can go ahead and, and if you need to make a change throughout your program, you can just do it with a simple change to one variable or one constant rather than having to change it in multiple locations. Um, we've also uh, implemented the ability to, you know, where Susan was showing the control shift O and the control shift M, which kind of showed you your blocks. In the past, that's the only way you could tell which subroutine or which method you were in. So we used the IBM RFE system, and uh, what we've added there is uh, the ability to see where you're at. Um, currency is uh, simply making sure that when IBM comes up with something new that we're going to implement it. Um, that includes uh, same position and, and uh, new varying dimension arrays. Um, IBM did announce 7.4. You can go ahead and read up on what's coming from them. Uh, compiling, you can do compiles. You can also do what's called program verification, which does a quasi compare or a compile right on your IBM um, I uh, on the Windows platform. I'll just go through some quick screens here. Okay. So it works a little bit differently for refractor uh, extract string constants. Um, in Eclipse, you would normally have to select the entire string. Um, in our case, we're, we're allowing you to pick um, a word or several words, do the extract constant. You'll see it's, all, it's very similar to what uh, the rename does. Um, shows you the generated code. Um, then it will go ahead and insert it. So if you if you like to make sure that you've got everything alphabetized. Um, we'll try to insert it wherever we can within that uh, um, order. And then as soon as you push OK, we'll go ahead and do the action. So in this case, uh, I had uh, uh, 19 cases of the word hello bobo with the exclamation point. Um, I can undo all of those after I push OK with a single control Z. The uh, naming function, now you'll see on the lower left-hand corner down here, the, the init and my procedure, that's telling me that I'm in the init subroutine within my procedure. Now that, with that, we've added a couple of different uh, procedures or uh, uh, preferences. So there's this one little, my one tip of the day is this little down arrow here on your RPG outline will bring up a way to quickly get to preferences. It also lets you uh, select um, or what we call toggle the uh, the location. So the fact that I'm down here in a init in my procedure, it's going to actually, with that selected, uh, show me in the init. Um, and again, we added two preferences: show the current procedure or uh, subroutine in the editor, or select the current procedure. That lets you decide how you're um, doing it. 
Um, copy members, again, this is instead of getting, you know, four individual copies, we're going to give you one. You're able to just quickly put in the library and the file and then push OK. And if you need to replace, you can go ahead and push replace. And with all of our panels, we give you the ability to, to browse if you need to. So, again, these are real quick. Um, uh, and I want to hand it over to Chuck now and, and thank uh, Susan and uh, Charlie for helping out today. Yep, and RDI just keeps getting better and better, doesn't it? It's it's pretty fantastic. So we do have a question for you. What kind of follow-up would you like us to do for you? Where do you need help? So we've offered up that polling question, and uh, uh, this also is uh, our opportunity to ask a few questions of Susan, Charlie, and Steve. And, and I, you know what? I've got a question that I'd like to present to the group is, I, in terms of the overall makeup of the folks that you're uh, doing your training for, for, whether it's RDI or RPG free format, um, what does it look like? It, it, we talk a lot about uh, IBM uh, Fresh Faces and that whole campaign that's going on. Certainly at Help Systems, we've hired a lot of, I'll call them young gun programmers, and you know a number of them don't, don't know RPG, but obviously they're getting up to speed. Susan, what are you seeing? Well, what I'm seeing is a lot of fresh faces. Um, we have, I'm actually doing a session here, I'm at a conference right now, and I'm doing a session later today on um, on how shops can can manage the um, RPG retirement issue. <laughs> yeah. As, as uh, experienced RPGers uh, retire with the free form, completely free form RPG and with RDI, uh, you can teach anybody. RPG and IBMI and uh, and people who have never seen RPG before are going to be productive right away. And so we're seeing a lot more. Uh, I'm doing a lot more training of people new to RPG. You know, I, I, it's been a long time since I've had to do a lot of training of this is what RPG is. Uh, and it's amazing to me how much they love the language. Mm -hmm. Awesome, Charlie. What are you seeing? You know, I I it, it, I'll. I'll repeat what Susan says, but I had I not experienced it for myself in in real life, it, it really it, that's when it really struck home. Uh, about a year, or maybe a year and a half ago or so, I was in a shop where they had multiple platforms. They had IBM I, and they even had some .NET developers. And while I was demonstrating RDI to their to their development team, the .NET guys wandered over. <clears throat> And, and, and wait, wait, that that's not what these guys normally code in. They're coding in this green screen stuff. What is this? And I showed him RDI. And then I brought up freeform code, and he said, wait a minute. He goes, this is not the code that they're normally coding. This is, I can read this. And it was it was a real aha moment for me. I said, you know, there you go. I've been hearing that line so much. But now I just, it, it really just struck, it, it was so striking to me at that, that moment. And I can see that happening over and over again in, in, in so many different shops across, you know, across the, whoever's using IBM I. It's, it's really a significant leap to use the new, the new code. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Tjorborn, thank you for hosting this event, and thank you, Susan, Charlie, and Steve, for your insights. Uh, if you are a customer of Help Systems, we really appreciate it. Uh, if you are interested in any other solutions from Help Systems, we'd love to talk to you. And with that, we're going to bring this webinar to a conclusion. I hope everybody has a great rest of your day. Appreciate your time. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, uh, all of you. And uh, take care. Have a good session later on today in, for the U.S. market, I think. Uh, and I hope to see as many as possible in Berlin in June also. And also there will be more webinars later on this spring. Thank you all, and bye-bye. Thank you, Torbjörn. Yes, thank you for hosting. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.